Ça me fait un grand plaisir pour être ici à uh, Clermont-Ferrand. Et uh, merci beaucoup à uh, tout le bureau de AEA et surtout uh, Eric. I'm going to obviously do the rest of this in uh, English. <laughs> French is not my, my, my mother tongue. So, you know, one of the problems with regional anesthesia when we first started it was that really it was something that was only done by experts and enthusiasts. Um, and for the rest of us, it was seen as something really quite dangerous. Now, thanks to ultrasound, that has changed. So with ultrasound, we can now do blocks more safely and more effectively. And we have seen more and more interest in regional anesthesia as a result. However, as you can see from all the people that come to these conferences, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia isn't always that simple. We can't always see the targets that we want, and it can be difficult to actually see the needle that you're guiding it towards. And so in recent years, we have moved towards trying to simplify our techniques to something that works well for most people most of the time, and most importantly, is safe for our patients. And this editorial came out with one of the first articles uh, on the erector spinae plane block. And I think the author summarized very nicely what we would like to see in the ideal regional anesthesia technique. Something that can be performed by everybody, something that can be performed quickly and simply, that gives you reliable and consistent results. Is opioid sparing, but not necessarily eliminating, so it doesn't have to work perfectly all the time. And again, most importantly, that it has minimal complications for your patient. And I would like to present to you today that the erector spinae plane block, which we described back in 2016, is perhaps a valuable technique because it meets many of those criteria. So what is the ESP block? For those of you that are not familiar with it, what this is is an ultrasound-guided paraspinal block into a musculofascial plane that's located between the erector spinae plane muscle and the transverse process. And by injecting in this area, we're able to anesthetize the dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve, the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve, and achieve a blockade of the ipsilateral thoracolumbar spinal nerves, and thus provide uh, anesthesia of the trunk primarily. How does this block work? These are the principles as we understand it today, but as I was talking with Philippe last night, there are still a lot of questions perhaps that remain unanswered. But I think what we've realized from this block is that number one, local anesthetic solution when you inject it will spread extensively within tissues much more than we uh, previously anticipated. In the most recent of what are now four or five cadaveric studies on this block, uh, this study by Eva Nusik out of Melbourne, showed that when they injected 10 fresh cadavers with 20 milliliters of methylene blue, there was this extensive cranial cordite spread and lateral spread as well. Now you can see here that uh, we have a picture of the lateral spread deep to the erector spinae muscle. But unlike some of the previous studies, what they found was that the ventral ramus was only stained in one out of 20 of their injection and they didn't stain the intercostal nerves. Two out of 20 of their injections, they saw the methylene blue tracking along the dorsal ramus into the area of the dorsal root ganglion and the spinal nerve. And because this was only seen in the minority of uh, specimens, their conclusions were that actually the erector spinae may not be an alternative to paravertebral blockade. And that they suggested that any analgesic effect that we see is due to coverage of lateral cutaneous branches. So it's not actually penetration into the paravertebral space. However, I must caution that this is not in agreement with what we've seen clinically. So clinically, and this is a picture from our very first case, this gentleman obtained anesthesia of the entire hemithorax, ranging from sort of just next to the sternum all the way to the back as well. And it's hard to think as to how this might occur just from spread in the superficial tissues. And we certainly thought about that initially. But in this particular patient, what he actually had was a lesion eroding his rib, uh, a cancerous lesion eroding his rib, causing his pain. And thus, it struck us that for him to re experience pain relief, we must be anesthetizing some deep structures as well. And so 
what I would say to you is that cadaveric studies are all very good, but the spread may be limited somewhat. There are changes that happen in the living human due to the respiration that may uh, influence the spread of anesthesia. And if you look at things like the serratus anterior plane block, uh, a similar cadaveric study suggested that injecting in that area superficial to the ribs cannot possibly work for rib fractures. But yet, this is a technique now that is being used very, very commonly, and there is no doubt about its effect. The other thing to realize is that what is clinically effective spread of local anesthetic may not always be evident. So this is a graph from a study of um, thoracic paravertebral blocks, and you can see the blue bars are the MRI visible spread, and the white bars are the spread of sensory loss. And you can see that the spread of sensory loss is much, much greater than that that was seen on MRI. And really, the connective tissues in that paraspinal space or intertransfer space are a lot more porous than we think. And there are actually channels that will allow local anesthetic to go from that area above the um, transverse process all the way anteriorly into the paravertebral space. Uh, these channels will conduct things like the dorsal rhema and the blood vessels and similarly will allow fluid through. And you must remember that even new six study did show that this was possible. They actually did get staining of dorsal rami of the uh, spinal root ganglion. So those pathways do exist. This cadaveric study will show you that too as we inject into that erector spinae plane muscle. You can see that fluid is going to track downwards anteriorly and flow um, into that area of the epidural and paravertebral space. And similarly, in this MRI study of some cadavers that we injected, you can see a lot of the injectate in that area of the erector spinae muscle, but it is spreading forward into the epidural and neuroforaminal areas where the spinal nerves arise, and even more anteriorly forward into the area of the sympathetic chain. Also, there is spread laterally into that intercostal area, thus providing a second mechanism for action on the intercostal nerves. And this most recent case report that came out um, shows the effect in actual live patients. So this particular patient had chronic uh, abdominal pain. They performed a T10 block for the uh, relief of this abdominal pain. They injected 30 mils, and the patient developed a sensory loss from T6 to T12 on the side of the ESP block. And when they did the MRI, uh, what they noticed was that this patient had both paravertebral spread, as you can see here, as well as epidural spread. And the interesting thing about the epidural spread was that it was circumferential, it was going right around. However, the patient didn't actually have contralateral sensory loss. Why might this be the case? So if you look at the difference in the signal intensity of the injectate, you can see obviously that the majority of the uh, local anesthetic has ended up in and around the erector spinae muscle in a lesser amount has entered that paravertebral and epidural space. And this brings me to that third mechanism that I think has become evident with the use of the erector spinae plane block. And that is that we only need a small amount of local anesthetic reaching a nerve to provide uh, analgesia. And when we look back at this old study that was done in uh, cats, in live cats back in 1984, you can see here that when they applied very dilute bupivacaine to the nerves of the cat, they actually got this differential block. So 100% blockade of C-fibers, which transmit most of our pain, only resulted in a less than 80% blockade of the faster pain fibers, the A-gamma, and 50% or less blockade of the motor fibers. And similarly, if you drop that concentration of bupivacaine even more, so even less mass of local anesthetic of those nerves, you see an even more pronounced um, differential blockade. What this means, though, is that if you use this block, sometimes you're going to see that the patient will still experience intraoperative pain or the sharp and fast pain. That won't always be blocked, and you may have to supplement with some opioids or some other analgesics. And again, it also means that you will not always be able to determine that there is sensory loss to pinprick or coal. And just like that MRI study, the extent of analgesia can be greater than what you see in MRI. But one of the good things is that we also very, very rarely see motor blockade with the ESP block, and that may be a distinct advantage. So 
why choose an ESP block over the more established techniques like paravertebrals or thoracic epidurals? First of all, and I think one of the most important, is that it's simple to perform. It's an ultrasound guided technique because we're trying to find the uh, transverse process, but the scanning is very, very easy. Um, I often recommend that people start with a transverse uh, scan because then you can easily pick up the tip of the transverse process. And it's a shallow structure, especially at T4, T5, and easy to identify. And once you've found it, you can mark it on the skin. And the classic approach that we recommend nowadays is to turn your probe into a parasagittal uh, orientation. And if you're a little bit lateral, you will be over the ribs, which you'll recognize as these rounded shadows with a pleural shadow below that. And if you move yourself in a little bit more medially, the shadow will change to something more squared off and you will lose sight of the pleura, which is curving away from you. Um, and that is the tip of the transverse process. And that's what we want to aim for. Come in with your needle, usually in plane. You can touch the transverse process to provide you with a safety backstop to stop you going too deep. Um, you sometimes have to pull back a little bit to get a nice injection. And doing a test injection will produce a very characteristic endpoint, which is this linear spread of fluid lifting the, trans the, the erector spinae muscle up off the transverse process, and the fluid should be spreading in both directions. So this is what it looks like. Um, advancing the needle towards the transverse process, in this case a toy needle. Now you'll see here that we are striking the what I call the near side of the transverse process, and sometimes what happens when you do that is that you are not actually uh, in the correct plane and you may find that you're injecting and expanding the muscle. If you see that you want to try and bring your needle a little bit deeper, maybe slide off the transverse process a little bit. And when you're in the correct position, you will see here that you get this very nice linear spread that floats the whole muscle up off the transverse process. And if you want, once you've opened that space, you can easily put a catheter into it as well which you can then use for topping up uh, or running infusions. Now, the second reason that I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very attractive technique to is that there is really no need to do multiple injections to cover multiple levels. Because it's a fascial plane, you get this extensive cranial caudal spread going up and down, and it seems to go in both directions regardless of which way you're pointing your needle. Uh, as I've said before, also once you've opened up that space, it's very, very easy to put a catheter into the space and you can see the catheter as well lying within that space. So it's been, since, since we first described it, there have been, as Philippe said, some 200 plus presentations about its use in chronic pain, thoracic and abdominal pain, but also in acute uh, pain scenarios such as thoracic trauma or surgery. And in particular, in many centers now, it has become the first line technique for rib fractures because it is so simple and easy, and thus most people practicing can actually use it. It's been used as well for abdominal surgery because now just by targeting a slightly lower level at T8, T9, we can cover the spinal nerves of that level. and It's been used in anything from upper abdomen to lower abdominal surgery. But all of these have been case reports until today. And I'm glad to say that now we're starting to see the first randomized control trials coming up. So there's been one in breast surgery, just published this year in uh, the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia. These were 50 patients undergoing breast surgery. Most of them were modified radical mastectomies, um, and, and most of them at least involved axillary dissection, so not really minor surgery. And what these patients got was a pre-anesthetic induction uh, injection at T4 with 20 mils of 0.25% bupivacaine, and they were compared with a group that didn't get any block. Now, all the patients did get some opioid and uh, some acetaminophen intraoperatively, and after the surgery, they got basically IV morphine, so no, no other multimodal analgesia. And what we can see here is that both groups had very well controlled pain, but the group that got the ESP block use significantly less opioid, indicating that the ESP block was providing an analgesic effect. And if you look at this graph of the morphine consumption here, so you can see that they both start out with fairly low opioid requirements, and that possibly is related to the intraoperative analgesia that was used, but very quickly you can see that the control group is using a lot more uh, morphine up until about the 12th hour after surgery, which is kind of in keeping with most of the truncal blocks. Most of the single injection 
blocks, tap blocks, uh, QL blocks, etc. last about 10 to 12 hours, and it seems to be about the same for the ESP block. We've also seen uh, an RCT come out now. Uh, this was in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, a small trial. They were doing this time bilateral blocks at T9 with 20 mils of, again, bupivacaine versus no block. Once again, the patients got multimodal analgesia intraoperatively, but they did not get local anesthetic infiltration of the port sites. And afterwards, they had, again, a, a tramadol PCA with some acetaminophen. And they were given rescue analgesia if the pain scores were more than three. And what you can see here, again, is that groups that got the ESP block had lower pain scores, and these were statistically significant for the first three hours or so. Uh, but what was most interesting the authors found was that these patients who got the ESP block had no uh, incidence of shoulder pain, which they attributed to the visceral analgesia that the ESP block provides. And again, over the first 12 hours, the group had significantly less opioid use. So I think there is evidence that the ESP block does work. Um, but efficacy is a relative concept. And I think we have to get away from thinking about uh, our regional anesthesia as always being anesthetic. There is a certain threshold for what is called, considered acceptable pain or discomfort and acceptable use of other analgesics, even opioids. Uh, used in appropriate doses, I think they are fine. And we want to look to it, what it allows patients to achieve, not just whether they use a lot of morphine or whether they have a lot of pain, but are they able to rehabilitate and to, uh, to achieve their, their recovery milestones. And we must remember that even epidurals and paravertebrals are not perfect. And so this one graph from, from one study, and I could pick one of many studies, shows you too that even with these so-called gold standard techniques, there's a huge variability in how much pain a, a patient may experience. So in fact, some people have called the ESP a light version or a paravertebral light. Enough to give you a buzz, but most importantly, not enough to cause you any complications. And that's one of the beauties, again, of something that, uh, you know, doesn't maybe work perfectly all the time, but on the other hand, is very, very safe. So we see a tremendous uh, benefit versus very little risk. And I think that's one of the most important things about the ESP block. It's amazing how many patients are reassured when I tell them that this is not an injection into their spine or their spinal canal, but rather an injection into their muscles. It's far away from any discrete nerve, so the risk of nerve injury is very low. We're not near any major blood vessels, rendering the risk of a hematoma or hemorrhage very, very low. We're away from vital structures, particularly the lung, and you know, you're nowhere in the canal, so the risk of an epidural hematoma or abscess is really going to be zero. Um, one of the things that I think does exist with any of these blocks where we're injecting a lot of local anesthetic is the risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So for this reason, I always add uh, adrenaline to all of my local anesthetics. I make sure that whatever volume I'm using, that the mass of local anesthetic is within the maximum recommended doses, and that the patient is monitored for at least 30 minutes because that's when the plasma concentrations will peak. Now, I've shown you that it's possible to get epidural spread, so of course hypotension then becomes a risk. But again, I think because so little of the local anesthetic is actually getting to that area, that this is actually going to be very rare, and if it does occur, it's going to be very mild. And certainly the reports that we've had from people are consistent with that. I've only heard maybe of one case of anybody who had any sort of drop in blood pressure. Pneumothorax, you can see here that we are way distant to where the pleura might be when we uh, target it. But having said that, I will say that there is one published report uh, out of Japan with pneumothorax. My only response to this is that anything is possible. And really, I don't think the risk is something that is inherent in the ESP block, but you know, if you choose not to perform it correctly, then as I said, all bets are off. So the, the last thing about the ESP block, I think, is that it's proving to be a very versatile block. And that's because these erector spinae muscles really extend all the way from the cervical spine down to the lumbar spine. And thus, although we started it with our injections at T4 to T5 for the thorax, moved to T7, 8 for the abdomen, really there are multiple levels at which you can perform the same block with perhaps differing effects. 
And so one of the exciting things about the ESP block is that it has opened up new paths for us and new applications for regional anesthesia. One of these uh, that's particularly exciting is regional analgesia for cardiac surgery. So traditionally, anticoagulation and being on pump has been the major obstacle to us doing any blocks for these patients. And so the question arises, is the ESP block something that's safe to do in anticoagulated patients? And I would submit to you that for any block in somebody who is anticoagulated, you want to think about two things. Will you hit a blood vessel? If you hit a blood vessel and a hematoma develops, is that hematoma going to cause any serious sequelae? And is there going to be a risk of massive hemorrhage just from arterial bleeding? And I would argue that in the ESP block, these things are not going to happen. And so we have uh, reported its use in left ventricular assist device insertion, where these patients are fully heparinized after the surgery, and we've performed these blocks in these patients with no problems whatsoever. And this is one report of its use in uh, median stenotomy, um, which showed its efficacy as well as its safety. And this has been followed by not one, but two, cardiac, two trials in cardiac surgical patients. And in this first one, uh, out of India, they enrolled 106 patients, so a decent-sized trial. The patients got bilateral single-shot blocks, again, pre-surgery uh, and pre-induction. -pre -pre and they noted that all their blocks were successful. They were able to find a loss to coal in all their patients from T3 to T8. Uh, after the operation, all the patients got tramadol and acetaminophen as well. But if you look at the results, they're very really impressive. The patients who had ESP blocks had no pain for at least six hours or more after extubation. This is a duration of blockade, again, in the area of 11 to 12 hours. And for a little bit longer, the pain that did occur was very, very mild. What, however, I think was most impressive was not only were these patients extubated earlier, which you might expect because they got less opioids and were less pain-free, but when you look even further out at 36, 60 hours, these patients were walking earlier, they were uh, eating earlier, and they left ICU earlier. So this is one of those few trials where we've seen the impact of a short-term intervention on longer-term outcomes. And for that reason, um, I, I think it's an important study to be aware of. The second one actually compared the ESP catheters, so a continuous technique of ESP blockage, with uh, epidural analgesia, uh, again, in elective cardiac surgery for stenotomies. And both groups, again, got some Tylenol, and um, uh, they reduced the rescue analgesia if they needed it. And what you can see here is that both groups, again, had very, very well-controlled pain. So pain scores less than two, and no difference between the epidural group or the ESP group. And beyond uh, 24 hours, there was a stati statistically significant difference uh, in the ESP group. But basically, essentially, this is a study suggesting that ESP catheters can provide analgesia that's equivalent the thoracic epidural. But we're moving beyond thoracic abdominal analgesia. So I said to you that we can do these at different levels. So you can do it at T1 and T2. And what happens if you do that? You may be able to provide anesthesia uh, for conditions of the upper limb. So this was our first report about this. Where are you feeling your pain usually? Donde siente el dolor normalmente? This is my colleague Mauricio Ferrero. Uh, treating this man in his chronic pain y clinic with the stiff shoulder. So you are feeling when you are the pain when you are lifting your arm. Eres capaz de levantar más el brazo de ahí? Me duele. Te duele. Me duele más si lo levanto. It hurts. From zero to ten, de zero a ten, how your pain usually when you are lifting your arm? Cuando estás levantando la. Eight. Eight out of ten. Eight of ten. Try to lift it more, please. Trate de levantarlo más. Ok. So he did a block, T3. Ok. Do your movement. This was the result. Perfect. <laughs> ¿Cómo está el dolor? Quedando 5%. Casi nada. Almost zero, right? Yeah. Eh? I can't believe this. Eh? Unbelievable. I performed the ESP blow at level of T3 with 20 cc of rapid 0.5%. 
So, I, when he first sent this to me, I got to say it was pretty remarkable. And and this is um, the, the 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 patient actually did have some mild sensory loss in this distribution, but I wonder if it struck you all that one of the most remarkable things about it was that he had virtually no motor block, uh, despite the relief in pain. Um, he came back and had this block repeated a couple of times, and in one of them, we did this injection of, uh, of dye and performed a CT just to see what was happening and if we could explain how this was working. You can see that the local anesthetic, as we expect, is tracking in that sort of erector spiny plane, but also tracking up into uh, the neck itself. And there was contrast, as you can see here, spreading into the area of the um, neural foramen and the, and the brachial plexus. And if we look at the muscles that come up into the neck, the erector spinae does travel up to the neck. It starts to change and become other muscles, the splenius, the levator scapulae, but essentially there are planes that can, are continuous with that erector spinae plane that allow the, the local anesthetic to channel up. And again, I think it's about getting just enough local anesthetic up there to effect some analgesia without causing a significant motor block. So can you then use it for acute uh, post-operative surgical anesthesia of the shoulder? Uh, and this has been experimented on by a couple of my colleagues, and we've tried it uh, at our hospital a couple of times. Um, so what happens invariably is that when you do it preoperatively, all these patients suddenly find that they can move their arm, um, and some of them will ask whether they still need surgery. But if they have um, surgery after that, um, one of the good things is that the risk of phrenic nerve block may be lower, we only done small numbers, so I cannot guarantee that. Um, but again, it doesn't provide complete analgesia all of the time. And as you know, the, sh the, the shoulder is innervated by multiple nerves. It also depends a little bit on what sort of uh, surgery you're getting. So the patients often will still have pain, particularly over the anterior chest itself. Um, if you do place a catheter, we found that rebolusing to the catheter can improve the analgesia. So at this time, I'm not going to suggest that this is going to take away or replace the interscaling block, and that, I think, is still going to be the standard of care. But it's an interesting option to think about uh, in patients, in for whatever reason, you cannot do a brachial plexus block. And this one report from uh, the Japanese group shows you such a case. Uh, a lady who got an extensive burn, you can see that trying to put a catheter into the area of the brachial plexus would be almost impossible. They did an ESP block, the patient had pain relief uh, down to zero. Uh, they kept the catheter in for five days and was able to use the catheter even for burn dressing changes and eventually too for uh, anesthesia for a skin graft. A uh, equally impressive case report came out of uh, Stanford in California by Ban Sui where he uh, inserted an ESP block for a four-quarter amputation, so an entire excision of a patient's arm um, as, as proximal as the scapula. Now, what he did in this case uh, was that he actually put the ESP in at T5, but distended and threaded the catheter all the way up into the C5-6 area. And so he said the surgeon could actually feel the tip of the catheter when they were doing the surgery up in that area. And again, this patient uh, had virtually no pain after the operation and for the three days afterwards that they kept the catheter. Similarly, people then have moved down and done blocks at lower levels to try and provide anesthesia of the lower limb. So this one, uh, in complex regional pain syndrome of the lower limb, these Koreans produce, place an ESP catheter at L4, producing sensory loss in the uh, L2 to S1 dermatomes and reducing this patient's chronic pain from 8 out of 10 to 3 out of 10. And when they did fluoroscopy, they saw this spread, which they said was uh, traveling along the area um, just adjacent to the vertebra in the sort of spinal nerves area. And uh, this Turkish group has published their experiences with using these blocks for both hip and proximal femur surgeries. And when they did some scans in their patients, they noted that there was apparently some spread into the lumbar plexus area. So at this time, uh, we've got two possible mechanisms for any lower limb effect. Is it spread into the, again into the area of the neuroforamina, or is it spread into the area of the lumbar plexus? And it's worth noting that there are some differences depending whether you do these blocks uh, at the thoracic level or the lumbar level because the bony anatomy of the vertebrae is actually different. So you'll see here that the superior articular process is a much more prominent structure in the lumbar area. So number one, when you're looking at it with ultrasound, the patterns are going to be different. You're not going to see that just the transverse process tip. You're now going to see one more sort of jutting out process and then a deeper transverse process. Um, and it's important to be aware of that.
Also, the muscles change slightly. In the lumbar area, there's this pronounced thoracolumbar lumbar fascia, and the muscles, there are actually two large components, iliocostalis and longissimus. Um, and close to the midline, there is also the uh, multifidus muscle, which you don't have in the, in the upper area. It's not such a pronounced structure. And when you look at the bony shadows, these show you too where the planes of these muscles are, um, the accessory process, uh, just between transverse process and articular process being where the iliocostalis and longissimus junction is, and then multifidus is uh, where the uh, articular process and the spinous processes meet. And the anatomy of the nerves then too is slightly different. So we were injecting up here with uh, the traditional ESP in the thoracic region, and you can see how the local would travel down here and, and get your ventral ramus. But in the lumbar area, Sorry, unlike, unlike here, where it's very, very close and travels this way along the rib, the ventral ramus goes anteriorly in the lumbar area. Um, and so perhaps it's a slightly longer distance to travel to get ventral rami spread, unless you believe that the local is going again centrally. And you can see here too that if we inject it on the uh, transverse process there, we would definitely get the dorsal ramus. And that has implications, as I'm going to show you, for applications possibly in spine anesthesia. Um, but there is that fat-filled compartments that we use to channel the spread of injectate again, and it does communicate down into the area of the dorsal root ganglion and the spinal nerve, and possibly forward to into the area of the lumbar plexus. So these are the possible mechanisms which I think still require further investigation. One of the problems, however, with doing it um, at the at lumbar area, or at least it's a problem in our Canadian populations, is that you can see that things are a lot, lot deeper. All right, um, And so you often need a curve probe to be able to see your anatomy clearly. The needle visualization, as you can see here, can be a little bit more challenging. So it becomes a bit more of an advanced technique if you have anybody who is a little bit on the heavier side. And also what we find too is you don't necessarily always get this nice spread that I was showing you um, uh, earlier on. And part of that problem is probably because of the way the muscles are constructed. So a lot of the muscles are attached firmly to the, to the transverse processes of the lumbar area. And so lifting them off the transverse processes becomes more difficult. One of the ways um, around this is to inject at a higher level, much as Bansui showed you by putting it at T5 and driving his catheter upwards into the cervical region, you can actually put your, your, your ESP at T10 and drive it down towards the lumbar area. And this is what uh, Josh Melvin and us reported for lumbar spine surgery. And Josh practices out in California, and this has become his standard technique for lumbar sacral spine surgery. He puts catheters in at T10 or T11. They stay out of the way in the surgical field, but yet, the local anesthetic that is bolus down towards that provides effective opioid sparing analgesia for lumbar spine surgery. So I think this is a very exciting uh, development for the ESP block because again, our options for regional anesthesia in spine surgery have been limited to infiltration by the surgeons. And in our center, which is a major spine center, we have had some very exciting results. So we do these corrective scoliosis, which as you all know, is an extremely painful operation. So this was one of the first cases where I did this. And now, again, we talked about how you can do it at multiple levels. So to cover this entire incision, I actually did bilateral, bi-level blocks, um, four of them in total, to the maximum possible dose of local anesthetic. The patient got a little bit of hydromorphone intraoperatively, but also importantly, uh, we combined it with other agents to provide some multimodal general anesthesia. And the patient woke up with basically no pain, uh, was on oral opioids by the morning of the next day and remained with pain scores of one or two for the next 36 hours and did very, very well. I'm going to show you one uh, more case that we followed after that. And in this case, just to see whether we could do it, we tried to do an opioid-free anesthetic. So preoperative uh, uh, ESP blocks again, um, four of them. And the patient remained very, very stable during the operation with no evidence of nociception. This is just running 50 mics of propofol. This is some dexmedetomidine. 
and ketamine at uh, half a milligram per kilo per hour. Your surgery's all done. So just open your mouth for us. We're going to take this tube out. Nice deep breath. So this is emergence. We still haven't given any opioids up to this point. Well done. You came through this really well. How are you feeling? You're good? Thumbs up? You sore at all? Yeah. Yeah, good. A little sore? Very sore? Okay. So she has got some pain. I think that's important to know, but it doesn't appear to be terrible. So she's scoring about a 5 out of 10. So we gave her a milligram of hydromorphone in the PCU. I will admit she promptly went back to sleep. Good. But uh, 30 minutes later, she was awake again. So tell me about the discomfort in your back. What kind of level is that? Uh, if I don't move, it's zero. Okay. If I laugh, which is going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of like a one or two. A one or two? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Once again, if you try and just uh, bend those knees for me, and lift them up off the bed. Good. Yeah. Can you lift them any higher? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, great. On the other side. Great. And so again, one of the nice out? things about using the ESP no. block so far in our like practice is that we haven't seen motor like block. Things. And importantly, like during the operation okay. as well, when we're doing um, neuromonitoring, we haven't seen any real effect on our ability to get somatosensory evoke potentials or, or even motor evoke potentials. Um, so that really is a big advantage to using these blocks. So, opioid-free anesthesia and spine surgery, is it possible? It is, but I probably would say it shouldn't be standard of care. These patients are still going to need a little bit of opioid. Having said that, just to prove the point, we did publish one subsequent case uh, in a lady who absolutely refused to receive any opioids because she had really, really bad post-operative ileus after her first surgery. Um, and this, this case, I think, is interesting too because it was uh, a revision surgery, so she actually had hardware in place and I just want to show you that, that even when you've had surgery and you've got hardware, you can actually do this block because the pedicle screws are usually placed in the uh, articular processes. And so you can still see transverse processes and you can still target those transverse processes because they're lateral to where the hardware is placed. And so you can see here we're lifting again her erector spinae muscle up off with the needle um, and we are lateral to where those pedicle screws are. So as long as you're sterile, uh, and your surgeon's not going to be too worried about you contaminating the field, this is a block that can easily be done. So again, she had an opioid-free anesthetic, and I think these components are actually very, very important to use, dexamethasone to use, ketamine to use, dexmedetomidine, and, and potentially those things too may potentiate and prolong the effect of your blockade um, together with a TVR anesthetic. And this patient did very, very well, only needing acetaminophen and some baclofen for back spasms during her entire stay uh, in hospital. So I think to sum up, the promise of the ESP block and also other related paraspinal blocks such as the retrolaminar block are that we are looking at blocks that are effective enough, they work, but most importantly they're simple, they're safe to do, they are finding application in a wide range of scenarios where we wouldn't have had regional anesthesia perhaps before, and more importantly that they are uh, applicable in many patients with so-called contraindications such as anticoagulation for example and they're easy enough to do that most people can probably do it with minimal training. So what I would suggest if you're going to try these blocks the easiest one is always to use them as a post-operative rescue. If somebody has pain and you have nothing else to offer try the block and usually you will see that the pain will come down um, and go to mild levels if not to zero levels. And any time that you think you want to do an epidural or paravertebral role, but you cannot do it for any other reason, this is a great block to use because really you have got nothing to lose. Remember that the analgesia may not be complete, so don't think that you don't have to give anything else. Using a little bit of opioid to try and uh, augment the block is perfectly fine. But ultimately, as I said, you've got nothing to lose really by offering to the patient because it's simple, it's safe, it's probably going to be effective. Um, so why not give it a try? And my hope is that we're going to go beyond just ultrasound and turn this into regional anesthesia being something that everybody can benefit from. Thank you. We have, you have shown in all these pictures that we have a massive spread in the erectospinal plane and within the muscles. And 
even thought that in most of the anatomical papers there is something spreading in the parvertebral area. There is another sympathetic chain that is located at the back aspect of the erector spinous muscle in the lift plane. Do you think that this could be an explanation? The, the posterior sympathetic chain. Yes, so um, as I'm sure you're going to talk about with quadratus lumborum, one other mechanism that people suggest is that our understanding of what fascias do, um, and if you think about manual therapists and physiatrists and how they sort of massage and, 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 and press things and produce pain relief, um, it may be that by injecting into these areas and spreading local anesthetic over the fascia itself, there is some sort of modulation of pain transmission which we don't yet understand. So that could be one mechanism by which uh, that works. Uh, I'm not sure it explains necessarily how we always get um, sensory loss to say ice or pinprick more anteriorly, but it may explain some of the effect. Just like is the action of sticking a needle into the muscles of the back also a trigger, just like the way acupuncture works, uh, these are possible, me possible mechanisms as well. I'm not sure how we would study them, but, uh, but they, they could, be, could be one reason too. Uh, I have a question. You explained that uh, uh, we could, you could have a diffusion from ESP block to epidural space. space. So uh, why you couldn't have the same thing with blood? You explained that there is no risk with hematoma, but you can imagine that you could have a diffusion blood from ESP space to uh, epidural space. The way, I, the way I see bleeding normally is that it would be contained in that plane um, and the amount of blood that would be able to track through before it coagulates is, I think, going to be minimal. Um, and like I said, we've done these blocks in patients who are fully heparinized and we haven't even really seen a, uh, a hematoma uh, developing at the site. So I think although you can get a fluid that is not viscous, like blood tracking through. Um, to me, it seems that the risk of, a, of, of something as thick as blood going through to the epidural space is going to be limited. Obviously, the, the numbers so far are still limited, so we can't say that never it's never going to happen. But uh, looking at it from a theoretical basis, I do think that the risk of uh, epidural hematoma is, is still going to be very, very minimal. So once again, it's about weighing the risk and benefits in your patients, I think. Uh, you know, I'm not saying you do it for everybody, but when you have to and you have no other options, uh, we have certainly done them for rib fractures and any patient who's on an anticoagulant without worrying too much about consequences.